I, I do want to say before we, uh, before we start the Q&A, and I'm mostly going to just throw this right to Q&A. I have very little to say, but I just want to take a moment. Uh, we all talked about this backstage, and it's so important. The last words you saw on that screen were for Christopher. Can we just hear a little something for Christopher Hitchens? <laughs> Now, once we open this to questions, which is going to be very, very soon, we know that all the questions are going to go to Lawrence and to Richard. So I want to point out the two gentlemen on the end, these brothers here, all the, are the whole word of brothers, and they're the ones that made the movie. So let's hear it for them for a second. They did a wonderful job. And I want to ask... Uh, I want to ask y'all, so you at least get one question in, because no one's going to ask you anything from the audience. Um, uh, I assume you started out uh, pretty like-minded to Richard and Lawrence, but having heard uh, the number of lectures that you heard and following them around with cameras, what did you feel, each of you, was the biggest change in, in experiencing uh, that community and that world that you traveled with kind of all over the world? Go Why don't ahead, you go first, because oh, you have the okay. less good hat. Right. <laughs> what was the... Wow, that, you should have asked me that before we came out here. I didn't think about that one. <laughs> what was the... Uh, uh, well, I mean, obviously, I don't think any of us were prepared for the Reason Rally. I mean, that was a big thing. Um, we were all surprised and just shocked when, when we were there. It, hard to explain what it was like, but it was this... this uh, feeling of, of just uh, that many people and, and so, so young and enthusiastic. I mean, we all know that obviously there's more of us out there than, than we all think at first. But the Reason Rally, I think, just blew us away. Um, it, it's just, it, it was an experience you couldn't explain to somebody if they weren't there. I mean, we tried to capture it in the film, but um, I, I don't know that there'll ever be another event like that. It, it, it was um, eye-opening, it really was. Um, well, for me, I guess just a little backstory. We both grew up uh, in a very Christian household, and for me, anyways, it kind of just when I left home, it just kind of faded away more than anything. But I think the biggest thing that I learned um, was kind of just the, the being honest with people, intellectually honest, and being able to say I don't know to something, and that being okay, rather than needing something to just to say to say something. Well, they made a great movie. Let's hear it again for them. Yeah, they did. They did. And it's like, it's like the Beatles in 1964. I can't tell them apart yet, but they are the whole word of brothers, and I'm happy with that. By the way, I want to say, I just want to let people know that they often, people often confuse Penn and I. So I'm, I'm, I'm anyway, sorry. Well, can I just, since much of the time we were actually talking science, I mean, what, Lawrence is a physicist, I'm a biologist, and I, I like to think that we had a kind of mutual tutorial. And, and one of the questions that I would have asked Lawrence if it had happened would be, what about gravitational waves? <laughs> you, that, you, want, you want me to answer? Well, <laughs> briefly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let me, before I do, let me say that I, a bunch of people have asked that, but I... It was, it's always a thrill to be with Richard, but every time we're together, I learn something. And so that, you know, we were together a lot during the shooting of this film, but it's always, I always learn things. It's, it's been, we do spend a lot of time talking about science, and, and, and so it's been, for me, it was just a complete pleasure. But gravitational waves, the neatest thing is, we've turned a lot of metaphysics into physics, because before, the earliest time we could see in the universe was 300,000 years after the Big Bang the cosmic microwave background radiation, the afterglow of the Big Bang, because before that the universe was opaque. You can't, couldn't see past it like you can't see the, past these walls. But gravitational waves interact so weakly that they could make it through that opaque universe. So if we could see them, we're seeing a signal of what the universe looked like when it was a millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. And we're really seeing, seeing back to the Big Bang. And that is just so amazing. And uh, I'm happy among other things that I kind of predicted it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I know you all want to talk to uh, these guys right away, so let's start right away with the questions. So my job from here on is just to point. Let's start over here. Is that where the microphone is there? Hello. All right, great. Uh, wonderful film. My, my question is quite simply to, to anyone who wants to answer. It's about uh, the role of celebrities and celebrity culture. In the film, I see that you had several celebrities that were doing 
uh, interviews in the beginning and at the end credits. I'm curious about how that process came about and what you guys are doing moving forward because frequently, you know, celebrities are tastemakers in our society. So I was just curious about that whole process. Well, I mean, that's what you said there is exactly the reason why we wanted to include them is because a lot of people know what Richard Lawrence think about these things, but to see somebody like Cameron Diaz up there, who you may not know, you know, shares these kind of ideas. And Cameron's not an atheist. You know, she's she's kind of more. Uh, she's like a fan to, of science. She likes yeah, well, she, she's, she's, she's a in there. She, very big fan she's of science. She's come to my lectures, and she's a real fan of science. Yeah, she, but she, she's more kind of like she believes in kind of Einstein's God almost. You know, she, she's like she's very close to there, but but not quite. But we thought showing some of those folks. Um, and showing role models from other walks of life, not just scientists, would, would help to maybe reel a few people in to start thinking about these ideas that haven't or wouldn't otherwise. Let me, let me add, I mean, one of the reasons of making a movie or doing something like this is to try and reach a broader audience. A, a, in particular, a, a, we hope a large set of people who've never thought of these questions. So there are people who know Richard and me, and they're, they're going to come to the movie. Uh, but what it would, is really ho hopeful is that people may be attracted because of some of the celebrities, but more importantly, it's not too surprising that Richard and I are fans of science, okay? But what I think is really neat is for people to see that their, their cultural role models are also fans of science and are interested in it and know something about it. And I think that's a, a message that I hope, think both Richard and I want to express is that science is part of our culture and it should be, everyone should be interested in it. And, and another point that uh, is really Christopher Hitchens makes this point in God is Not Great. He doesn't make it uh, quite this uh, impolitely, but you don't have to be smart to be an atheist. Uh, <laughs> and that's what I've been trying to prove. Um, <laughs> you don't have to be as smart as these two to say, I don't know. And I think having people up there that are out of the sciences, but love what comes from the sciences, and also are able to say, I don't know and won't follow these rules and have that kind of um, self-possession is a very important point to make. And I know I, I said that in a way that uh, was a little bit funny, but there's no joke intended. You don't need to be Wiley e. Coyote super genius to, um, to realize that uh, these, these uh, fairy tales are not true. <laughs> and Richard, I mean, the other thing is in the movie, I think you see that we're both also happy not to know, uh, you know, to learn from each other. To, I mean, be interested in science, but not, you know, to be, to be in awe in some sense of what other people are doing, I think is, is great. Yeah, anyway. Jim, my question is for the Hall Warder Brothers. Oh, great. Uh, in the scene, it really is, in the scene where Richard Dawkins is in his hotel room, <laughs> um, that scene, it, to me, is just the best moment in the film. <laughs> and I'd like you to maybe talk a little about uh, how that scene happened, what was going on there, uh, and the way that you hung on the nightmare that he was going through was just genius. <laughs> Thank you. You want to start? Uh, <clears throat> we drew a lot from um, uh, the war room and the Meeting People is Easy, a film about Radiohead. Um, and it was kind of this view of kind of a dreary view of being on the road and being in a band and kind of flying to one city, taking a cab to the venue, doing the show, signing autographs, off to the next thing, just, just churning it out. And um, that, that kind of happened. It was just an organic thing that happened. And we, we said, you know, Richard had these interviews set up and we said, we'd love to film one. And for the most part, we were just sitting there just hitting record, <laughs> letting it roll because the guy was well, just talking his ear off. Yeah, yeah, we just kept waiting for Richard to speak. <laughs> and, and after a while, you start to realize the guy on the other end of the phone isn't interested in what Richard has to say. I mean, I mean again, it's, there's a lot of editing done there. He, I'm sure he was a really nice fellow. But, um, but we, we decided to go the Hitchcock route and draw that out as long as possible. And um, I, it's one of my favorite scenes also. It, so. You know, and I think we were all surprised. I mean, you know, because there's the interspersing with the, me running around. And uh, uh, I, I think we didn't know how people would take that, yeah. and, and whether it would look bad for Richard, actually. And, it, and I, think it, I think for many people, it's the favorite part of it. It's, didn't it's you say that um, Werner Herzog said it was his favorite? Yeah, yeah Werner yeah. said it was his favorite part of the movie, yeah. too, yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, this question is primarily for uh, Mr. Dawkins, uh, but I would love to hear any, everyone's take on it. Um, as uh, uh, technology progresses exponentially, um, once uh, we're able to recreate 
uh, the human mind and create artificial intelligence. Uh, do you think we'll be able to predict how that would develop based on the evolutionary model? And um, I had something else, but that. <laughs> I doubt if we would predict it from evolution. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a fascinating question, is whether uh, computer technology is going to replicate human minds and whether they will be conscious. There have been various bets taken. There was a bet uh, some years ago about whether a chess program would, would beat uh, grandmasters, and, and that took a bit longer than was expected. Um, bets about artificial intelligence are taking longer than expected. I have no doubt at all that eventually computer intelligence will mimic human intelligence and will be, will, will be conscious because there's no reason to suppose there's anything other than a different kind of computational machinery, a very different kind, but it is computational machinery inside the brain. But I don't think I would use evolutionary expertise to predict which way that's going to go necessarily. Evolution doesn't plan for things. So, but, it, but I think it, what's, what's pretty clear is that when computers, I agree with Richard, when computers become aware, self-aware, which I think is inevitable, and my Mac will before a PC, but anyway, uh, <laughs> that, that, um, uh, uh, that... So you are religious. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that, that it will be, that whatever, that, that it will be difficult for biological systems to maintain that, so that the dominant intelligence, if, if, if humans want to be part of that, we'll probably have to, to merge with that. But there's one really neat thing that I don't think is in the film that you should think about, the challenge of this, that right now, if you want to build a computer, a digital computer, that would have, say, the processing power of the memory storage of the human brain, it would use 10 terawatts of power. 10 terawatts of power. The human brain uses 10 to 20 watts. So it's a factor of a million of million. There's clearly something different about the way the human brain is computing than current digital computer. So it's going to be a challenge. I, I don't think it's going to happen soon, but I think it'll happen inevitably. This question is primarily for uh, Professor Dawkins. You, in the film, it was alluded to the fact that natural selection does not plan ahead to have a positive outcome. But I would like to challenge something about that. The laws of physics have been used in cosmology to predict the future course of the sun, the universe, and many other things. And I'd like to, to uh, throw out the idea that evolution also follows the laws of physics and therefore has possible outcomes and possible future courses and, and roads and so on that are predetermined by the laws of physics. Now, I'm not saying the outcome's predetermined, but is it, R Professor Dawkins, do you think there's potential for science to analyze these possible future courses of evolution to help mankind av avoid bad forks of the road? We're talking about two different things here. You're, you're talking about the potential predictability of the future which I think is a very interesting question, and I agree with what you're, you're saying. However, what I was talking about was something rather different, which is that uh, there is no foresight in natural selection, uh, because there's a very common fallacy that people, since natural selection produces outcomes that are good, that are good for the animal, it's very tempting for people to think that there's something all-wise, all-powerful about natural selection, that somehow it can look ahead and take action, say, to prevent the species going extinct, something of that sort. Natural selection cannot do that. Natural selection is a blind, meliorizing force. It just chooses the best outcome of available ones, and that means that it cannot look ahead and foresee what's going to happen and take, uh, take action to, to prevent disasters in the future. Now, humans can do that, at least potentially. Humans and our, our culture and our computers and our science can look into the future, can predict the future, not very perfectly at the moment, but I, I accept your point that there may be a, a science of, of futurology of the future, in which case we can uh, 
do something that natural selection could never do. Let me, let me add, because people well, quickly learn when people ask Richard questions, I answer them. But um, that I think to get to the other part of your point, it, it, it's just a lot more complicated. The reason I'm a physicist is because it's easy. I mean, it's the easy stuff. Biology I, is, is much harder. It's much more complicated. And therefore, it's much harder to predict. It's hard to predict. You can't predict where all the molecules in this room are. And you know, think about the number of cells in the human brain. So it, it, it inevitably, I think, is the laws of physics and the laws of nature are determined. They're completely uh, deterministic, even in, in including quantum mechanics. But it's so complicated that I, I think it's very hard to imagine what this complex system or model what this complex system is going to do, in my opinion, as a humble physicist. So well, I was well. answering the wrong person, wasn't I? Yes. I yeah, yeah. yeah. In future, can anybody wave when they're asking? <laughs> yeah. okay. you can't tell I'll also come. try to point. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go over to stage right <laughs> over here. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mark, uh, and as an anthropology student here at the university, I want to thank you all for coming out here. It really means a lot. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question, um, once you leave here, it's going to be obviously us who are spreading your message more, assuming that everyone here is mostly atheist. Um, and uh, in, in the movie, you guys were bringing up the, the beauty of science, and uh, I, I have that beauty and that appreciation. Uh, a lot of my friends and family don't have that natural beauty, they're not in the sciences, and so maybe they have other beauties in their life. Um, acknowledging that, uh, do, uh, Professor Dawkins, what do you think is the, the best way for you, with your friends and your family, perhaps, uh, to find what their beauty is and relate that to atheism, and do you, do you think that maybe like organizations like the Sunday Assembly are, are doing a good job at trying to embrace that? I don't know about the Sunday Assemblies. I, I, it, it, it's not my way of doing things, and I, I haven't been to one, and I don't think I'd be that interested in doing that, but I fully appreciate that some people do. Um, science, for me, is beautiful. Uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be in a world that we are able to increasingly understand. Uh, so I'm in favor of science education of a, what I would call the Carl Sagan approach to uh, to science, as opposed to what I call the non-stick frying pan approach. Um, <laughs> the, the, there is a school of thought that thinks that science should be taught in, in a sort of practical way. Uh, you, you use science, in the science of the kitchen, science of cookery. Um, the non-stick frying pan is a spin-off of the, of the space race. That seems to me to be demeaning to the space program. Uh, the space program is, is about exploring the outward urge, uh, the, the excitement of reaching out to the, into the universe. So I think Carl Sagan, rather than Margaret Thatcher, who, uh, <laughs> who once gave a lecture on television on science, talking about the science of cookery. Um, so there are people who think that the way to make science exciting and inspiring is to, say, is to bring it into the home and say, this is everyday science. Well, everyday science is great, but the science of the universe, the science of the galaxies, the science of looking down a microscope, the science of looking inside a living cell, uh, that's, what I would, that's what I like to inspire people with. Hello, gentlemen. Um, Hi. Mr. Dawkins, Mr. Teller, Mr. Krauss. Um, honestly, uh, oh, I said that wrong. <laughs> Either way. Doesn't matter to me. Honestly humbled by your presence here. Thank you for coming. It's all right. And, then, and this is more of a question of interest over science in general, but I'd like to ask you, with the massive amount of matter that we have in this universe, do you honestly feel we are the only intelligent species here? Uh, in the universe, I'm, I think it's highly unlikely. Um, there are 100 billion galaxies in the universe, each containing 100 billion stars. Moreover, we know that at least one kind of intelligence forms from, from uh, organic molecules, water, and sunlight, pretty easily. In fact, within about, within a, as soon as the laws of physics allowed, within 500 million years or so after the Earth formed, after the comet bombardment stopped, the earliest uh, 
life forms appear to have evolved. So it, if, if we're wanting any example, it appears to be pretty easy in a sense, although we still don't know how, although I do think in the next decade we'll, we'll learn how. And so, and the thing that people should realize is that the universe is full of, obviously there's lots of starlight, there's lots of light. Water is ubiquitous, and so are organic molecules. The basis of amino acids, rather complex organic molecules, are being discovered in comets all the time. It's quite likely that the basis of the first complex molecules that formed RNA came from space, in, in, or at least were, were, were uh, created um, in, in due, due to chemical reactions and comets or, or something like that. So it's, that appears to be ubiquitous, so it's hard to imagine, and now we also know that most stars have solar systems around them, which is something we physicists thought of already, be, you know, we're pretty sure of, because if you built a star on a computer, it generally had uh, an accretion disk that would fragment and form planets. But now we learn that not only are there planets around every star, but there are planets that we never imagined were possible. We, it, all of the laws we thought that there had to be big gas planets out in the outer part and, it, and, and, and not in the inner part, we've learned that all that's wrong. It, the, the variety is much greater. And, and, I find that all the time, that the universe continues to surprise us. So the possibilities of life are, are, are great, and I'm absolutely certain that there's, that there's life elsewhere in the universe. Now, intelligent life is a very different question, because it's not at all clear it's an evolutionary imperative. We're here due to some accidents, uh, evolutionary accidents, but I believe even if it's, it's really rare, it, there's so many possibilities it's hard to imagine that it's not out there. However, that's the good news. The bad news is that I think it's highly unlikely that we'll ever know about it. And I, I could explain that, but I think I've talked long enough. I, I agree with all that, and I would just add, um, the, f the famous Miller-Urey experiment where it was shown in, in the lab that you could get the right kind of organic compounds in, if you simulate the early conditions of Earth, that's no longer necessary, yeah. because those compounds are now known to be in meteorites. They're all over the universe. One thing I would add, if you're a, one of those people who wants to believe that we are alone in the universe, then given that there are something like 10 to the 22 stars, and most of those probably have planets, the paradox is that if you want to believe that we're alone in the universe, that means that the origin of life on this planet was a spectacularly improbable event. Such a, so improbable that you might as well give up speculating about how it happened. Because what we're looking for, if you believe that we're alone in the universe, what we're looking for as the chemical event that gave rise to the origin of life is an event so improbable that you would call it impossible by ordinary standards. And of course I don't believe that, and so I agree with Lawrence. I think that probably there's lots of life in the universe. I also agree that we may never know about it, because by the very same argument that says, because there are so many billions of planets available for life to form in, and they're so spaced out, the chances are that these islands of life may rather sadly never encounter each other. Hi, my name is Ed. I will thank you all for coming to Fabulous Las Vegas, and your movie was great. Thank you. Uh, I've seen all your documentaries on YouTube. And my question is for Professor Krauss. Black holes, they say that light can't even escape them. Mm -hmm. But in a young universe, you've, you've seen energy or light coming out the top and the bottom. Well, if light can escape a black hole, how does that happen? Well, um, our universe, well, <laughs> first of all, actually, it, it, very small black holes are very bright anyway. They tend to evaporate by something called Hawking radiation, which is what made Stephen Hawking famous. Uh, we think, we've never tested it, but th the laws of physics suggest that should be the case. But more importantly, um, the early universe isn't a black hole, as far as we know. Um, we think that the universe on large scales is almost flat. And that says something quite interesting. And, and I learned this from Tommy Gold, who, who you may know. I, when I was a high school student, he really inspired me. He was an astrophysicist and writer. Um, and this is really neat. Take this home with you. Um, black holes are really weird objects for, for most people because, yeah, light can't escape from them. If you took the sun and you compressed it to the size of Las Vegas, it would become a black hole, probably a lot like Las Vegas. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but and, and every teaspoon would, would weigh millions of tons. That's what people think of black holes like. But the properties of black holes change. If you had a black hole of the mass of our galaxy, 
it would have the density of water when it became a black hole. So it's not so unusual. And here's the neat thing. If you had a black hole of the mass of our universe, its density would be within a factor of two of the density of our universe. So we could be living inside a black hole in principle. It's not too bad. Take that home with you. <laughs> Stage left. Thank you, gentlemen. I have only one question for the panel in 23 parts. <laughs> Uh, but seriously, um, I actually changed my question because there was a, a point in the movie uh, where Professor Dawkins mentioned taking back certain terms like morality and intelligent design. And one of my pet peeves is the misuse of the term theory. And I want to know what it's going to take to take back that term from the colloquial meaning of a guess and bring it back to its true scientific meaning of peer-reviewed proof. That will take a miracle. <laughs> do, do, Richard, do you want to? I mean, one thing is that we, we have to be careful when we use the word theory. Um, and, and I've said this somewhat facetiously to, to when I say it's my friend Brian Green, but uh, that it's, a, it's an insult to evolution to call string theory a theory because it's not a theory. And, and I think he agrees with that now. I, I, a theory in science, as you know, is something that's very different than a guess, something that is well tested over and over again. And, and we use that word, unfortunately, scientists use that word inappropriately as well as the public. We have to be very clear that theory is the highest thing you can attain. Quantum theory, general theory of relativity, evolution. So I think uh, we scientists have to be more careful. But it's, it's really hard, I think, to imagine changing that meme, if you want, wish, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in society, in my opinion. I don't know if Richard agrees. Yes, I think it, we're fighting a losing battle trying to get people to change the way they use the word. Uh, I, I think we need to start talking about the fact of evolution. It is a fact. It's a totally secure fact. There's no, no doubt about it. And we need to, to stop even using the word theory for, for it. Call, it. call it a fact. That's what it is. Thank you, John. Good question. Stage right. Hi, I just have one question. What do you think of the new cosmos? <laughs> Well, the honest answer is I haven't seen it, okay? Neil's a good friend of mine. I don't have TV, I don't have cable. Um, and um, the other answer is that I, I worked, I Here. talked to Annie Here's Dream. Here's bucks, yeah, get yeah, cable. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> I'll take it. No, um, no and, uh, but I, I, I'm very enthusiastic. If you may have seen, I've written about it. I think it's a great thing that, that science is on TV and, and, and it will hopefully help create more science on TV. It'll convince those idiots who program TV, who think incorrectly that science isn't interesting to the ground. Well, look at this. And every time we're have, Richard and I are going to be at a meeting at my institution on Saturday, and there are 3,000 people paying to come listen to science. And every time we do so, there's 3 million people listen to Science Friday. People are fascinated by science, but TV producers don't realize it. So I hope it'll do very, very well, because then it'll convince these nudniks that, that, that they should put something interesting on TV, and then maybe I'll get cable. Well, you um, know, but anyway. what he's really shown here is if you, if you want to know about the definition of an astrophysicist, it's someone who writes about something he hasn't seen. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, I hate to do I, this, but I warned you all that I had to go. And I, 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 I actually do. I, my wife and I are going to something, and I, 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 would, I don't want us to miss it. So I'm, I'm going to unfortunately have to leave. But I, I thank you all for coming, and I'm sure that Okay. Well, I have seen I have seen the new the new cosmos. Uh, I I have no right to have seen it. It's not been shown in Britain. I've I've seen it illegally. Uh, I I downloaded a piece of software which fools my computer into thinking it's in America. Uh, and uh, so I've seen the, the four episodes that have so far appeared. I think it's terrific. Uh, I, I loved the original Cosmos, and I think that Neil Tyson is doing a fantastic job. I think, I think it's great. And now that, uh, now that Lawrence is gone, we can really talk. <laughs>
I noticed that neither one of the lines got any shorter when Lawrence left. Uh, over here, stage left. Hello. Um, so everyone here shares uh, a huge appreciation for science, as we saw with the cops for the cosmos. And science is the only game in town when it comes to describing the world. However, there's some other normative distinctions that are left over. And I was wondering, like, as atheists, we still might have some conflicts over normative decisions that aren't descriptive, which science provides answers for. Oftentimes, religions fight over those normative distinctions that can still exist with atheists. So I was wondering, like, do you have any thoughts on how we could use our knowledge to inform something like a debate between a libertarian and a socialist or other situations that are still left over, conflicts, absence, God? I think it's clear that science in itself cannot answer normative questions of morality, of the, of the kind of society in which we want to live, political decisions like that. Uh, but the methods of thinking that characterize science, when, uh, when you think about what moral philosophers do, and moral philosophers consider moral questions, in a scientific way, I mean, using, using the methods of logic, which are the same as the methods that, that science uses, uh, scientists can in massively inform moral questions on abortion and things like that, uh, not, not fundamentally saying what is absolutely right or wrong. There probably isn't such a thing as absolute right or wrong. But what science can do is say, if you believe so-and-so, then you're being logically inconsistent if at the same time you believe so-and-so. So we can hugely edify uh, moral, moral discussions and political discussions by not just scientific knowledge, not just factual knowledge, but by the scientific way of thinking. And I wish that uh, really all moral decisions and, and political decisions were informed by scientific thinking rather than just calling on scientists for expert knowledge about facts. Call on scientists as well for expertise in how to think. What is the one scientific discovery you all would like to see within your lifetime? The nature of consciousness and how it evolved. Ditto. <laughs> I was going to say longer battery life, but now I feel like a dick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, stage left. Hi, this question is, is for Professor Dawkins. Uh, I'm a student here in molecular biology. I was hoping that you could comment on a quote from uh, Charles Darwin. He, was, he said that a scientific man ought to have no wishes and no affections, a mere heart of stone. I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I see what he meant. Uh, we, we have to take the facts as they are, take the world as it is, and uh, dissect it, and analyze it, and report it, and accept it, whether we like it or not. But of course, we are human, and uh, we do have human emotions. And so, uh, I've never actually met a scientist, I think, who is that cold-hearted, and Darwin himself certainly wasn't. Hi there, Professor Dawkins. Um, I'd like to say, A, first, it's an honor to get to uh, talk to you, because I've been following you since I was about this tall. And B, I actually have that same program on my computer to watch iPlayer since being in America. Um, my question for you is, uh, for all of us, or at least most of us here, who consider ourselves atheist or practically atheist, um, a lot of us pretty much get flack for being atheist and we get called, or at least I get called, a godless heathen. Uh, we got compared to rapists in that one report. What would be your plan, you think, to break the negative stigma and connotations to being atheist in society? I'm astonished. Uh, I, I've read the, the same poll that he referred to and, uh, and I've seen it It's often quoted. Um, I don't meet these people who say things like that. I mean, I, when, when I come to America, I don't think I ever meet people who uh, are religious maniacs in that, in that way. Um, I assume that the people that I meet and talk to are nice, intelligent people, and I assume that they don't believe in God. Um, and 
I'm, I'm always astonished when I read polls like the one you refer to. So uh, I, well, that's the, that's the first thing. Um, I'm hoping that there will be a tipping point phenomenon, that uh, there are actually far, far more people who are not religious in America than many people realize. And there's going to come a time, I think, when we start to, when everybody starts to, re to realize we're numerous. We're not alone. We're numerous. And then it, there will be a tipping point and suddenly it'll go. Politicians will suddenly realize that they no longer have to pretend to be religious as they do apparently at present. All politicians in America think they have to pretend to be religious. Uh, and they all say, God bless America and things. Uh, it isn't statistically possible, I think, that all 535 members of the US Congress are believers in a supernatural being, as I think all but one or maybe all of them now pretend to be. They've got to be lying. We, we, know, we know they're lying. I mean, it's just st statistically inevitable that many of them, maybe even most of them, I mean, some of them are quite well educated. So, I, I think that, that, that when, when politicians start to realize that they no longer have to lie, uh, and then there will be a, a tipping point, and then it'll go rather suddenly, rather quickly. I think it may happen much more quickly than most people realize. But you, you also have to keep in mind that those kinds of studies that say, how do you rank an atheist? How do you rank this? Uh, it's a very badly designed question. Uh, Christopher Hitchens said, we will never have an atheist president. We will have a president who is atheist. And that's a very important point to this. Because if you'd ask people in 1980 if they would uh, elect a divorced movie actor, they would have said not at all, but they elected Ronald Reagan. And the same thing that happened with the gay movement, there were some parallels to what will happen with the uh, atheists, is people will start to say, would you love, respect, trust a person who was atheist as opposed to would you trust an atheist? And those are two very, very different things. And I think that those questions themselves, it's the humanizing of the idea. It's not an idea that these people, it's an idea these people are bothered by, it's not the people. And we just have to remind them that it's the people that matter. Well, <clears throat> I just wanna say, I mean, that, that question is essentially the entire point of this movie is to show that that change is happening. I and mean, when you see that Reason Rally and you see that, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. I think the work that people like Richard and Lawrence and, and all the other people who appear in the film are doing is helping. And then people, everybody here is helping just by talking about these ideas. I, I think it all, it all gets us there. I'm very optimistic about, about all of this. It seems to be going very well and very, very quickly. I mean, when I was, uh, when I was in high school, it was very, very difficult for me to find uh, an atheist to look up to, and now we're maggoty with them. I mean, just look at how fast the gay movement has, has, has moved. Yes. I mean, it's just, uh, and something like that's going to happen, I think. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's happening so quickly that when we look back on it, our heads will spin. Mm. Over here, Steve. As a um, science teacher and in Utah, and someone who will debate the missionaries that show up at my doorstep, I often feel that I'm banging my head against the wall. So when you're out speaking to overly religious groups, how many people do you have to reach to feel that you've been a success and it was worth your time? I'm sorry to say that when I go out and speak, they don't come. <laughs> I, I, I tend to find myself preaching to the converted, which is not a bad thing to do, actually. I mean, that's, that, that, there, there is some value in that. But I don't, on the whole, get hecklers. I don't get people standing up and... and, and I mean, they, they heckle outside. They, they stand outside and hand out leaflets. But they tend not to come in and challenge me directly, which I think is, uh, is a great pity. I'm told that the uh, annual conference of the American Atheists is taking place in Salt Lake City this year. And so maybe you should go along there. Have you, how, how many people have read um, Douglas Adams' uh, 
Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. It's a lovely... Remember, there's a, there's a character called the Electric Monk. Um, uh, and the Electric Monk is a labour-saving device which you buy to um, do your believing for you. <laughs> and this particular Electric Monk has developed a fault, um, which, I mean, never mind, mind about that. The point is that the Mark II Electric Monk I think it was called the Electric Monk Plus, as it goes back to the days when it was the Mac Plus, it is capable of believing things they wouldn't believe in Salt Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I do end up uh, uh, speaking to people who are not atheists. I have been uh, outnumbered many, many, many times. And uh, what I had to learn, and it was difficult for me to learn, was the absolute inverse of what I said earlier. I had to learn, having been surrounded in my close friends and family by atheists, I had to learn that people who believed in God were also a-okay, and that the vast majority of them were kind and sweet and gentle and open-minded. And sometimes we forget that, because sometimes we like to brag about our hate mail, sometimes we like to be macho and talk about how people hate us and how we're raging against the machine and we're fighting this whole powerful thing. And sometimes we do ourselves a disservice by pretending, by making jokes like that and pretending the other side is, is, so, is so stupid and making that kind of caricature. Because the same kind of thinking that says um, that uh, an atheist is less respected than a rapist is the precise it's not like it. It is the exact same kind of thinking that says that Christians are rednecks and all want to beat us up and we all hate them. Because the fact of the matter is, if you take all the people in the world and round off the numbers, all the people are good. The vast majority of people are kind. And um, I have sat in an auditorium with 200 um, Glenn Beck supporters, who I would think these people would consider to be the worst people possible. And you know something? They were wicked nice to me. And let's please never forget that, that they can be nice too. So, hate the, hate the sin, not the sinner. Ready? Okay. Uh, first See? <laughs> there are women in the atheist movement. See? And all of us are over here. <laughs> Um, first, I'd like to thank, uh, say thank you, Professor Dawkins, for coming to Las Vegas. I heard you on KNPR on our state of Nevada, which is our small radio station. And I felt very proud that we finally got to have an international scientist on our small state radio station. It was awesome. Um, and also, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Gillette, for your perspective, uh, your non-hard scientific perspective and sharing of atheism. Um, my mother came out to me a year ago, said you know, after being a Catholic for 40 years, she, she told me she was an atheist. And I was like, so proud. <laughs> And I I'm pretty sure it was because of watching you on YouTube, actually. Um, my question is based on, um, regardless of your atheist or humanist or whatever, we all have this sense of awe and this sense of, you can call it spirituality, when we look up in the sky or when we stop and we notice the birds singing. And we all kind of have a sense that there's something greater than us out there. And many religious people call that God. We, we sense it, in a, they say it in a sense of faith. But... I believe that, uh, well, my question was actually for Dr. Krauss, but he left. Um, but I really do want to hear your perspective as well, everybody else's perspective as well. Um, do you believe that there will ever be a time where, say, you know, maybe the grand unified theory or how M, M theory works, and I feel kind of dumb about using that word theory now, thank you, um, that maybe there will be a time when spirituality and science can be married, and maybe there can be a scientific explanation for that spiritual feeling that many of us feel? I think the only problem is the use of the word spiritual. I mean, I, I, I feel exactly the way you feel, and you can call it spiritual if you wish. I wouldn't actually call it spiritual, but I, I would call it perhaps poetic, uh, and I feel it very strongly. I feel it when I look up at the stars. I feel it when I as I said earlier, when I look down a microscope, when I contemplate the complexity of life, the, the prodigious complexity of every single one of your cells, let alone your whole body, uh, that fills me with wonder, that fills me with a kind of poetic sense of uplift, which other people would call spiritual. And the only reason I would not call it spiritual is that that plays into the hands 
of people who would then wish to say, well, then you must be a believer, a believer in the supernatural, something like that. I absolutely am not. I think it's actually rather demeaning to that sense of scientific wonder to import a, an idea like supernatural, which is not doing justice to the grandeur of it. Uh, this question is for any one of you gentlemen who would like to pick it up. Um, but as an atheist, uh, what would you say to a well-meaning mother or grandmother um, who, while she says that she loves you no matter what, uh, also claims to worry for your soul and stay up at night praying for your salvation? I would say I love you very much, unconditionally. <laughs> There's no other job you have except to love your family uh, in that kind of situation. Uh, you just have to, no matter how much love Christians can lay on you, you got to equal it and double it. And you have to sympathize. I mean, they, they, if, if they believe that you're destined for everlasting hell, then that's a very serious worry. And uh, so I think you have to, to sympathize with, with, with what they feel. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, it's, it's so easy to turn that into a, into a dividing thing. And they are concerned, and when they, when they claim they love you but still worry about you, that's not a claim. They absolutely do, and just love them back. Well, Gallup poll would suggest that I'm both the most and least trusted in America today, being that I'm an uh, atheist nurse. So I apologize that my question is just the um, subject matter of Dawkins' tie tonight. <laughs> makes your I didn't hear what... Your tie. Oh, I was just tie. asking, Richard, what, what is going on with your tie? Oh, my tie. Um... <laughs> he didn't know there were going to be hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, all my ties, uh, the only ties I ever wear, are hand-painted by my wife, the actress Lala Ward. And so this is my Galapagos tie, uh, and she painted it for me when we went to the Galapagos Islands. Um, the bottom there is a Nazca booby. Uh, that is a blue-footed booby. Um, that's a, a Galapagos flightless cormorant, which is a remarkable bird. Um, it's lost the power of flight, but it still has wings, and like any other cormorant, it hangs them out to dry, which is a rather beautiful thing. I think that's a Galapagos hawk, and I can't see what's in the knot. But, um, and there's an egg on the, the, the other end. Thank you. So. I have to say, um, you know, we don't get asked a lot of the questions, but I mean, the, the benefit is just to be able to hear stories like that. And um, there was one moment, I don't know if you remember, when we were in um, Canberra in Australia, and we were at Lawrence's place, or Nancy's place, and we were waiting for them in the car, and we saw these um, mud daubers outside the car. There was oh, yes. a mud dauber nest. And we walked out there, and you were looking at this one that was really high up, but there was one like right here, and I said, Richard, right here. And you walked over to it, and you went, the female mud dauber goes out and grabs water in her, and you started telling me this, and then Lawrence came over and just said, we gotta go right now. <laughs> <laughs> just interrupted the whole thing. They're magnificent creatures. <laughs> uh, you, you can find them, you, almost certainly around here, you find them under bridges. Um, they build mud nests, which look, they're called organ pipe mud daubers. They look like organ pipes. And each one of these mud tubes is, is filled with spiders, which the wasp goes and hunts, catches the spider, stings it, not to kill it, but to paralyze it and then lays an egg on it, and then puts a whole lot of them in, in these tubes, and then they, they hatch out. These are, oh, they're just amazing. <laughs> See, when Lawrence is gone, we can hear things like that. <laughs> We're gonna do two more questions. So there's a bunch more people in line. So if you have got the best question in this line, you should move to the front. If the best <laughs> question this line, you should move to the front and work that out among yourself. If your question sucks, go back to your seat. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I hope this question doesn't suck. But it, I'm, it's, I'm... it's the last one from that side. 
So if your question is not really good, the guys behind you are going to kick your ass. Okay, so I'll, now, I'll, I'll be quick. I'm originally from Belgium, <laughs> but I live in Texas. And I'm wondering why is the U.S. still so much more religious than Western Europe, and why can I, what can I personally do about that? What, why is... Why is the U.S. so much more religious? Oh, uh, it's, uh, it's such a big question. Um, I, I can only answer the comparison with Britain, where in Britain we have an established church uh, with the, the Church of England. The Queen is the head of the Church of England. The church runs royal weddings and opening of parliament and things like that. This means because there's an official church, religion has become boring. Whereas in America, religion is sort of exciting because it's run on private enterprise and you have mega churches advertising with each other, competing with each other for huge congregations. Tens of thousands of people going to churches come to my church, not that church. And the, the, and the tithing that, uh, that, that goes on. So I think that possibly is one, is one reason, but um, maybe the Pilgrim Fathers had something to do with it. Certainly the Founding Fathers didn't, because they were all as, as near atheists as you could be in the 18th century. Yeah, I think the freedom of religion is one of the things that, uh, that let, it go, let it go so wild, is just uh, allowing everybody to have that. And I'm very glad that's the way it happened because if we, I mean, if we look at this thing as a laboratory, I think there's no doubt that the U.S. is moving toward the right answer. It just takes a while to think about things. Now, do you think that's a better question than you guys had? Otherwise, hit them. Uh, oh, you had the best question in that line? Yes. It's the last question of the night. There's a huge amount of pressure on you. I just want to stress that. I teach that. public high school. I teach science. There's no pressure that's bigger than that one. Sorry, folks. <laughs> I, teach, I teach biology and I teach earth science, so I get it all the time. How can you believe in this or that or the other thing? Mine is a very practical question, Professor. You wrote in one of your books, I can't remember if it's Blind Watchmaker or one of the other ones, about a computer program you made that did evolution, that showed evolution. I can't remember which program, which book it's in. Is that program available someplace? You had a friend of yours write a program that would starts with a very simple creature. Yes, okay. Um, it's in The Blind Watchmaker, and then it was again in Climbing Mount Improbable. Uh, I wrote it for the Mac, and I wrote it, and it, it, it runs on the old Mac before System 10. Um, and I would love it if somebody were to rewrite it for uh, modern computers. I modern would love computer. it too, because it would give my kids an ability to play with it to show, yes. see it in a very real time. Yes. The hardest thing they have, whether it's in earth science or biology, is that it's such a small, the change happens so slowly. Yes. And high school students have no anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I if mean, I could, if, 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 it was, if it was somewhere, I would love it if you could get yeah, somebody I mean, lot, to do that. Yeah, I mean, lots of people have rewritten bits of it. I mean, if you, if you look on the, on the web, if you search for blind watchmaker program, search for biomorphs, com computer biomorphs, okay. you'll find that there are quite a lot of, of pr programs out there which mimic my original program. And so, uh, yes, you, you, can, you, can, you can find it there. But I would like somebody to rewrite the whole, uh, the whole of the original one. Okay, your question was all right. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the whole word of brothers who made that film, Professor Richard Dawkins. Pendulette. Pendulette.